Plastic bottles are used daily by millions of people, and for something that is manufactured on such a large scale, they quickly become an afterthought. However, the way plastic bottles and other everyday things are designed and manufactured can be very interesting. I created my own design of a common plastic soda bottle using SolidWorks, and I'll walk you through how it was done. Plastic bottles are manufactured using an injection blow molding process and are made of PET plastic, which is a thermoplastic polymer and comes in the form of pellets as a raw material. Before the pellets become a bottle, they are first molded into a preform, or sometimes called a parison. The preform includes a bottle cap thread at the top, and the preform body resembles a test tube. Preforms are like start parts. The same preform can be used in many different molds to become different shapes. The preform is then put into a two-part mold where pressurized air is blown into it, making the preform expand into the shape of the mold, forming a bottle. Next, the mold is quickly cooled, then the part is released, and excess material is trimmed off. If you look at a bottle closely, you can see the parting line where the two molds met during the blow molding process. In my own 3D model, I looked at the design in three main sections. The upper portion of the bottle, including the threads for the cap, the lower portion with the feet, and the middle portion that blends the two together. And then finally, the detailing work that gives the bottle a unique look. To show you how this soda bottle 3D model was created, I'll start at the beginning of the feature tree and roll back as I go over the features and tools I had challenges with, as well as some unique modeling choices that resulted in the desired geometry. This particular 3D model used some basic solid modeling, along with a lot of additional planes, split lines, surface modeling, and even some mesh 3D texture creation, which uses a feature new to SolidWorks 2019. Before I began 3D modeling this part, I wanted to keep in mind that it should be as parametric as possible, and that the main aesthetic features should be independent of one another. Meaning that whenever achievable, I would avoid constraining and referencing new sketches and features to existing geometry to avoid breaking features if they were adjusted later on. A good example of this is that since this is a revolved part, the directions of circular patterns should be determined by the axis of the main body and not a circular edge. Even though it would create the same geometry, the result parametrically would not be the same. To get started, I'll roll back in the feature tree. And let's look at the very first sketch, which only consists of a picture of a soda bottle for reference that I imported using the Sketch Picture tool. Sketch Picture has an option called Enable Scale Tool, which I use to scale the image to the size of an actual soda bottle. I traced the image in another sketch to create the revolved boss base which is the initial starting point for the model. From this point, I could start adding the aesthetic features, starting with these curves here. You can see that these curved edges are not aligned with one another and reach their highest and lowest points at different angles on the bottle. So I made two cuts to create the shape of the misaligned curves. The first cut is made from a sketch on the front plane. The shape of the curve on the bottom is the same as the top curve, except that it's rotated 45 degrees. So I needed to make a mirrored version of the cut, but angled by that amount. To do that, I created another plane, 45 degrees from the front, by selecting both the front and right plane as the references and created the sketch for the next cut extrude on that new angled plane. Choosing two intersecting planes creates a plane angled between them. After the cuts were made, I used a solid loft and some guide curves, pierced to the sides, to reconnect the main parts of the body into one. The geometry at the bottom that makes up the feet of the bottle was created by a cut sweep, and then a circular pattern. After shelling the body and adding some revolves for detail at the top, it was time to make the thread of the bottle. Creating threads manually is usually a very simple task, 
in this case making the thread consisted of two sketches, two features, and a plane. Specifically, the way to create a thread is to create a helix, which would act as the sweep path, and another sketch attached to the helix using a pierce mate that would act as the sweep profile. First, I made a new plane offset from the top face, which would be used to create the circular sketch that I used to create my helix. To create the thread, I needed another sketch that would be swept, which would create the geometry. To do that, I needed to create yet another plane normal to the start of the helix, at a point where the new sketch can use a pierce constraint. Selecting another plane and the end point would result in a straight up and down plane at the correct location, but it wouldn't be normal to the sweep. The desired plane was easily created by selecting the end point of the helix and the helix itself. Then I added a cut extrude for the finishing touch. The next set of features were used to create these decorative patterns on the body here. You can see that some split lines, circular patterns, a surface offset, and some thickened cuts were used. I'll show you how these tools came into play. When I was initially trying to create the sketch for this feature, I wasn't able to use Convert Entity on this edge, and I couldn't dimension or add constraints to it. I would get a warning that said, the entity could not be projected onto the sketch plane. This is because the edge had no end points, it wasn't a flat circle, and it continued around the entire part. To get around that, I used a single line sketch that went through the face that I needed to dimension to, and used split line to essentially split it in half, allowing me to use convert entity, dimensions, and constraints on it. Another obstacle I faced with creating this geometry was that the edges that the sketch would connect to were not uniform around the part. If I constrained the sketch to the edge here, then my pattern would fail because it wouldn't reach the same edge at its higher points. Since this sketch is being used for split line on this face, I made the sketch slightly oversized at the top, so the split line would always work on any location of this face, no matter the height of this edge. After creating the split line, I used circular patterns to place them around the bottle. Next, I used surface offset to copy the faces. By setting the offset distance to zero, and use those copies with the Thicken Cut tool to cut the shapes into the surface. Next, I'll show you how I added this patterned bump texture to the curved surfaces. It's good to remember that there are most likely more than a few ways to do this, and sometimes trying to find the easy way to do something in SolidWorks might actually take more time and work than just doing it the obvious, tedious way. It's always an interesting thought process, as design challenges like these come up, in deciding how much time to spend researching what tools and techniques would do something more elegantly and efficiently than just using brute force. I wanted this texture to be made up of round bumps instead of straight extrusions. This made it even more challenging. One of the methods I landed on started by creating the initial dome on the surface using the Revolve tool. I then used existing geometry to create 3D sketches and used curve-driven patterns to pattern the dome horizontally and then vertically. The reason I opted to keep the original dome as a separate body is that doing so would let me create individual patterns of each of the vertically patterned domes. If they were all patterned at the same time as faces or features, the pattern would fail, because each dome is placed in a unique position on the curved, non-uniform face. So that I could easily control the path of each pattern, I created a master sketch for the texture, allowing me to adjust each of the paths in a single sketch. Then for each new line, I created a projected curve on the surface to use as the curve-driven pattern's path. Then I used the Combine tool to attach each dome to the main body. And when needed, used the Delete Face Tool's Patch option to clean up the edges, giving them a round, uniform appearance. It may seem tedious, but this method got the job done, and the height and path of each dome are fully adjustable. Luckily, if I wanted to, 
I could pattern the bodies to the other side of the bottle, saving me from doing all that work again. But instead of doing that, I'll walk you through another method. This time I'll use a 2D image and the 3D texture tool to create the texture. Using the 3D texture tool would generate a separate mesh graphics body. Since I wanted this texture to apply to only this surface and not the entire part, I constructed a separate body on which I'll add the texture. Using Offset Surface, I copied the surface and offset another surface into the part so I could loft these two surfaces together to create a solid body. Next, I dragged the 2D image that I created in Photoshop onto the surface as an appearance. Notice the edge of each circle is blurred and fades to white. This is what allows the 3D texture tool to create a dome-like shape. If they were perfectly round dark circles, straight extrusions would be formed instead. In the 3D texture tool, I adjusted the settings until I got my desired results, and voila! I automatically created the dome texturing on the side of the part. And even though I didn't use the combine tool, since I created the mesh on a solid body as opposed to a single surface, when I export the 3D model as an STL, the texture is included on the part, as if it was combined with the main body. Next, I added embossed logos to the blank surfaces by simply using a sketch of the logo and the wrap tool. And as usual, I saved the fillets for last to finish up the part. So, that about did it. Like they say, there are a lot of ways to skin the cat, but this is how I approached this one. Hopefully you saw a few techniques that will come in handy in your own models, and if you have ideas about how you might have done this model differently or more efficiently, we would love to hear from you.